This is the Texas Instruments SR16 handheld calculator. I recently picked this up uh, from a guy who was selling a box of old calculators. This one particularly interested me because uh, the very first handheld calculator I owned was this very same model. This calculator went into production back in 1974. So as of the making of this video, that would make it 45 years ago, so this is quite the antique. Unfortunately, he also had the power supply brick. Now I did plug it in and give it a shot. Unfortunately, it did not work. So I decided to open up and see if I could do a little brain surgery and maybe get this thing running again. Now it's fortunately very easy to open up because it's just two Phillips head screws, one here and one here. With just those two screws out of the way, the back just conveniently lifts off. Now, <clears throat> when I first opened it, what I found was a battery compartment here for three AA batteries. Now, there had been some foam here that had completely disintegrated. This foam had completely turned to dust. On these uh, metal contacts, there's some bluish material indicating that there was a battery leak. This calculator used nickel cadmium batteries. This, of course, is before the days of nickel metal hydride. But what is nice here is it's got regular contacts. You can just pop in three ordinary batteries, and when they go bad or need to be replaced, you just pop them out and put in new ones. And that's so much nicer than devices today where the batteries are soldered into place, or you can't get at them, or you can't remove them, or they're some crazy proprietary shape you'll you'll never find a replacement or they'll be really expensive just plain old double a's very nice thank you for that now one of the things i found were this wire and this wire had broken loose and i had to uh, figure out where they went it took me a while but if you need to know since they're not labeled this contact point here that's the positive and this contact point here is the ground Another problem I found is that the power switch, that power switch right there was not functioning. And I, I actually soldered a little piece of metal in here between those contacts so that I could turn the thing on, at least, at least power it up. Now I've gone ahead and put in three nickel metal hydride batteries. And yes, it's actually alive. It's working. Now a word about this power brick. This is early 1970s technology. There's nothing inside of this brick except a step-down transformer. That's all this thing is. You know, it's 115 volts AC in, and it's 5.6 volts AC out. Okay, now on the oscilloscope, when we look at the output, that's what we get, just a straight sine wave. So the power supply produces only a simple AC sine wave. So how do we get our DC voltage? So we have a diode. And so just a simple single diode. So this is basically a half wave rectifier. It's AC on one side and it's sort of rectified on the other side. I am going to connect the power supply. And we will look at this on our oscilloscope before the diode and then after the diode. Okay, this is the waveform before the diode, simple sine wave, and after the diode, a sine wave with the lower half chopped off. Yep, and that's all it's doing. What this tells us is that there's no filtering capacitor on the other side, and that apparently is what the batteries are for. So we're going to go ahead and put the batteries in and try it again. Okay, with the battery in, here we are before the diode, and we're sort of clipping off the very top of that sine wave. And here we are after the diode, and I've got my oscilloscope set to uh, one division per five volts, so basically it's giving us five volts. So back before the diode, the clipping at the top there is probably when we're charging the batteries. Basically what this means is you can only run the calculator with the batteries in. Now we are connected to the charger and the batteries, and we have, you know, normal operation. If we remove the batteries, 
This is what the calculator looks like when it's running on the AC power supply, but with no batteries in. See? So what's happening now, of course, the voltage is, is just spiking, as we saw in the oscilloscope. Basically, the voltage is turning on and off 60 times a second. So we're getting all this craziness on the screen. If we can smooth out that voltage, we could run the calculator uh, with the power supply and without the batteries in place. Now, normally in a power supply, there will be a capacitor to smooth out those voltages. And there is a small capacitor right here in the circuit board. This is a 32 microfarad capacitor, but that's just obviously not big enough. I suppose if that capacitor were a larger value, you, you probably could run it on the AC power supply only without the batteries. I was sort of curious. I have here a 220 microfarad capacitor here. Here's that original 32 microfarad capacitor. And here is that 220 microfarad capacitor soldered around it. So they are in parallel. That gives us a total of 250 microfarads. It's flush with the circuit board. This way I can close the top over it. And this is the waveform before the diode. And this is the waveform after the diode. We're going to change our multiplication there. We're on two volts per division. So our voltage is maxing at uh, 8 volts and then down to 5 volts. It's quite a sawtooth, and that indicates that this thing is really pulling a lot of power. These early LEDs really were very power inefficient compared to current generation LEDs. Now with our new capacitor in place and without our batteries, how are we doing? Well, that looks about right. So it is functioning on the AC power supply and without the batteries. Now, this is really a, a better situation because I'm not going to be using this calculator on a daily basis. This really is a museum piece at this point. So I don't want to leave batteries inside of this thing. I might be pulling this out once a year, you know, and using it. So I don't want to leave batteries in there that are just going to be wasted and eventually leak. But it would be nice just to pull it out and use it every once in a while so I can just plug it into that AC power supply and all away we go. Now, one of the things that enables me to do this, of course, this capacitor has eight times the capacitance of this original capacitor. And I don't believe that capacitors of this high capacitance and small size were available back in the early 1970s. These early LEDs were very power inefficient and they really drew a lot of power. So the more LEDs that are turned on, the more power it should draw. In fact, I think that display becomes a little bit less bright uh, the more LEDs that I light up. So let's see what that looks like on the oscilloscope as I add digits and increase the number of illuminated LEDs. I apologize for the images being out of focus. For some reason, my cell phone camera doesn't like the oscilloscope and refuses to focus on it. But anyway, you can see that waveform up there. Now, as I illuminate more LEDs, watch what happens to that waveform. It drops lower and lower. Wow, all the way down to two volts. Now I have all eight LEDs illuminated and the voltage is now peaking at eight and dropping all the way down to two. Now watch what happens when I hit the clear button. It just springs right back up again. So boy, those LEDs really pull a lot of power. Each one of those peaks is separated by only a 60th of a second. So it's just really draining that capacitor fast. This is the battery compartment. And originally in this battery compartment, there were three nickel cadmium batteries. Now this wire here is going to the negative terminal of these three batteries. And this wire connects to this post on the receptacle for the external power supply. Oh, right in there. And then there's another wire connected to that same post, this purple wire, which runs over to the middle post on the main power switch. And this post here, this is the positive terminal for the three batteries. And it is soldered to the uh, rectifier diode. And also it is soldered to a wire, which then takes the positive voltage to this point on the main board. Now over on this side, the main power switch, when the switch is thrown in this direction, it connects this wire to this wire, which then takes the negative to that point on the main board. I've gone ahead and put in three AA batteries, and they are hooked up in series. 
and it goes negative positive and then they connect here and then negative to positive and then they connect here and then negative to positive. Now these batteries that I put in are nickel metal hydrides. Now the nickel metal hydrides are 1.2 volts each just like the nickel cadmium batteries are. Now the nickel metal hydride batteries of course are a lot cheaper and they're more available and they do not contain toxic metals such as cadmium, so they are not a disposal problem. So they should work fine. Now I still have the problem of the broken power switch. There's that little switch right there. I, I soldered in that little piece of metal to basically lock it in the on position, you know, so it's, it's bypassing the switch. But I don't know where I would ever find another switch like that. And for that matter, I don't know that I could even get it out. Here's the switch on the outside. I don't think that'll come off. I think it's uh, it's probably glued on top, and the switch itself is melted into place. It's on two pegs. They slide it over the pegs, and then they melt the pegs, holding it in place. I don't know how on earth I would, would get this thing out, even if I could find another one. I might just have to leave it like that. At least this way, it's on. Whenever I, whenever I get connected to the AC, it just turns on automatically. So I, I guess I'm just going to leave the switch the way it is. I don't know how I can fix that without basically destroying the thing. So I found a simple solution to the broken switch, and that is by bypassing it. The calculator will function. It's just that I'm not able to turn it off except by removing the batteries or unplugging the uh, external power supply. So I guess I'm just going to leave it the way it is then. So I found this old SR16 calculator. I was able to bring it back to life after 45 years. I mean, this thing, I'm sure, hasn't been turned on in decades. But here it is after all these many years, and it still works. We had to solder on some broken wires. The wires inside of here all become rather brittle. And some of them had broken off. So we re-soldered the broken wires. Also, we added capacitance so we can run it on the power supply without batteries being in place. Uh, as far as the switch goes, the switch is broken. We simply bypassed it so we can turn the calculator on. Again, it's basically a museum piece now. I'm not going to barely be using it on a daily basis, so I really don't need to be able to turn it on and off. It's just going to turn on whenever I turn on the power supply. It's just going to come on, and that's probably good enough. That's our Texas Instruments SR16 from 1974.